Hi, Kelsey. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Good. Thanks so much for taking time to talk with me about Monarch Services. I really appreciate it. Oh yeah, of course. Thank you so much for offering to host. This is really exciting. Yeah, I really feel that this is important. So um, there's so much information that I'd like to get out to the community. So can you tell me about the services that Monarch provides? Sure. So I'll give kind of an overview of our services sort of pre-COVID and then we can kind of dive into the specifics of what's happening now. Okay. But, um, basically Monarch Services um, is we serve the entire county of Santa Cruz. We have offices in both Santa Cruz and Watsonville and we also have the only um, emergency confidential shelter for survivors of violence in the county. Um, we have a 24-7 crisis line that's available for anyone, any survivor of domestic violence, sexual assault, human trafficking. We have um, a host of services that we provide to those clients as well. So once someone comes in, either through regular operations or through the crisis line, we have a housing program, we have legal services, we have um, counseling and support groups that we offer and um, a host of wraparound services that are provided by our advocates. All of our services are offered in English and Spanish, which is really critical in meeting the mm -hmm. need in the county, especially for our most vulnerable. And I think that's the bulk of our survivor-focused work. And then in addition to that, we also have an outreach program, um, particularly focused on the migrant field worker population. We offer prevention programming that's focused in local schools, middle schools and high schools, that really kind of gets to the root and underlying causes of violence, kind of cultural norms, gender equity issues, healthy communication or communication and building healthy relationships. Mm -hmm. Really kind of focusing on building the, those basic skill sets so that we're preventing violence from happening in the first place. Um, I think that's really where a lot of the domestic violence and sexual assault movements are going. And I, I think we have a really amazing and robust prevention program that we're hoping to expand. Um, that's that's so awesome. Better. Cause it can help prevent break cycles. Right. And I'm a former public defender. And so I can't tell you how many clients that I saw coming through the system who were charged with domestic violence or sexual assault cases who either had been victims themselves or had witnessed that, that type of trauma um, as children. And so it's a cycle. And the earlier, you, the earlier you intervene and break that cycle, the healthier people, families, communities are. So in addition to our prevention work, we also recently started offering um, motel vouchers to women who are being released from custodial situations into homelessness, because we know that's a time when Women are particularly vulnerable, um, and there's really not a lot of safe places to go. So that's a service that we recently started offering and we're very proud of. And then lastly, we are just about to launch our program that is offered to those who have done harm that really focuses on a lot of the issues we talked about with prevention, building healthy relationships, sort of breaking down all of those unhealthy um, learned behaviors and kind of figuring out how to do things in a healthy, productive way moving forward because the individuals who have done harm, again, they've experienced a lot of that trauma as well. And oftentimes we see that partners choose to stay together. And so you can't break the cycle unless you're also working with those who have done harm. Mm -hmm. And even if they don't stay together, those people remain in our community and they go on to have other relationships. So it's really important, I think, to approach it, both serving the survivors meeting their needs and trying to break the cycle of violence with those who have done harm as well. So how have um, these programs changed since the shelter in place order was implemented? Yeah, that's a good question. So I think the whole world's been turned upside down and yeah. um, we, I think I'm really proud of our response. Monarch was able basically to pretty rapidly convert all of our services um, to virtual kind of remote um, accessible, I guess. So 
Some things have changed, but the bulk of our services remain up and running. Um, our offices are closed, so people are accessing us through phone. Um, our emergency shelter is still open, but we're not accepting new clients right now. It's full, and even if it weren't just for health reasons and um, you know best practices for those types of programs, um, we're not accepting clients. So what we're doing instead is offering motel vouchers to survivors mm -hmm. and their families um, who need a safe place to go during this time. And then, I mean, the, the way that a lot of the services have changed, but I would say the biggest shift that we've made other than going virtual has been trying to stay on top of the needs of the people that are coming to access services um, from us and making sure that we're prioritizing around their needs and meeting them. Well, that was going to be my next question. Have the needs increased? Have there been more demands? How have the needs changed? Yeah, so we've seen place. a pretty dramatic shift. One, just a, a significant increase in the number of people that are calling us to the crisis line. We've seen a 40% increase in the last month, in, particularly domestic violence, domestic violence survivors who are who are reaching out to us in need of support, um, which I, I don't think it comes as too much of a surprise, unfortunately. You have families who are required to stay at home, perhaps in unsafe situations, and you add the economic instability mm -hmm. to that, and I think it just is exacerbating tensions in a lot of households. So yeah, we've seen a 40% increase in our sh crisis line calls, a 60% increase in our intakes, and I think we've seen, I have it written down, a 35% increase in clients who need both emergency shelter and financial aid, food support, just accessing basic necessities. So that is where we're pivoting to and trying to focus our efforts right now to make sure we're meeting that need. So I assume the offices are closed or the doors are locked. So how can people access your services? Yes. So all of our offices are closed to the public right now and the majority if not all of our staff are working remotely um, but we are still up and running and you can access us by phone so we have our nine to five business hour line that people can reach if there's not a crisis but they want mm -hmm. some support with legal services um counseling support whatever the needs may be financial assistance um, and that phone number is 831 722-4532. Again, that's our regular business, non-emergency, non-crisis line. And then for someone in crisis who needs support any time of day, 24-7, they can call us at 1-888-900-4232. Okay. Um, what do you think that uh, the community can do to support Monarch Services? Because I feel like I want to help but I feel a little bit helpless. What can we do as a community to help Monarch Services provide these services um, and just help the community? Yeah, thank you for asking that question. I think there's a lot of people who feel sort of confined to their homes right now who are seeing what's happening in the world and they want to do what they can and they don't really know, you know, mm -hmm. what ways they can do that right now. So I think it's a really timely question. And um, I think there's kind of two ways that I can see people stepping in and supporting right now. Obviously, times are difficult for a lot of people financially right now, so I would say if you have the capacity to give to local organizations serving people in crisis, um, please do. Um, we would really appreciate it. I know a lot of organizations in this community doing that um, frontline work would, and if you're not able to do so right now, that is totally okay. And just raising awareness, using your social media platforms, reaching out to your networks, and sharing the work that's being done in the community. I think that awareness raising and making sure that one, people who want to support are able to access us and know, mm -hmm. know where to go. And that also too, anybody who needs support, anybody who's looking for um, rental assistance, anybody who's in crisis, that those people too are seeing that information and they know where to go. Okay. Thank you so much. I just want to emphasize one more time before we conclude the office non-emergency number, the 831-722-4532 number, mm -hmm. and then also the bilingual crisis line, 888-900-4232.
Um, so I, I thank you so much. I really appreciate you talking with me and being open to doing this. And um, yeah, I just really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks again, likewise. And it's good to see your face. It's nice to I have know. in person to person interaction now again during this time. So. I know. <laughs> it's really good to see you. And I'm kind of like drooling all over the beautiful books you have in the background in your bookshelf mm -hmm. and like wondering what you have in there so I can borrow. Oh, we have a ton of stuff. It's a good mix of my husband's preferences and mine. So there's some real nerdy sci fi, and then there's some, I don't know, some historical fiction. So oh, I love like that. that. Some mystery fantasy that I'm sort of into. <laughs> I don't know. It's a smorgasbord. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much. And I hope to see you soon. Likewise. Bye. <laughs> Bye.